Welcome back to week six of Identity, Vocation and Mission, The Grace of the Third Week, Love. I'm Deborah Kent and I'm your lecturer for this unit. We begin by reflecting on a gospel reading from John. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one who has ever seen God it is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. In that text, God the Father is always the initiator. There are three events at work here, three events that we enter into in sacred history and in our spiritual lives. God enters into history at the moment of creation. The word is limited, limited to time and space, enjoys all the limitations of humanity, and yet reveals God in that moment. But despite this revelation, he is rejected by men. The glorified Christ communicates with his children in his risen humanity. I too am called to collaborate in my own salvation. It is this entering into humanity, this word who becomes flesh, that Ignatius draws to our attention and treats so reverently. Ignatius's spiritual writings focus on the humanity of Jesus, our connecting point with God. The second week of the exercises is structured in such a way as to confirm all that St. Peter denies in his threefold denial of Christ in the Passion Stories. It is an examination of what deep friendship is with the beloved of God. This type of friendship is not simply being friendly. It is a friendship that requires a full commitment. Friendship that is not a technique but a praxis, a friendship in which there is mutuality, loyalty and conversation. There also is growth, but through correction, always geared towards reconciliation. Howard Gray, SJ, says, there is not a smooth sailing in this week, but a faithful sailing. For what we experience is the costly friendship that draws us into discipleship. The one who enters into the second week, it is assumed, is the one who is capable of this friendship, who is capable of being a friend to Christ, a friend with Christ. 
you can see how the exercises become archetypal as they give a way of identifying stages of the spiritual life. Those who are called into this service in friendship do not work for the kingdom but live within the kingdom. The kingdom is realised in and through the way they serve. Through their service in friendship they make present the kingdom of God. The challenge of this week is not to know the Lord more intimately but rather to serve the Lord more perfectly. Before we can make decisions for God, we need to know and to know deeply what it is to live in friendship with Christ. Howard Gray again emphasises that the logic of the second week is not exactitude but relationship. It is the call of Jesus, the one who calls us to form a friendship with him. This is our consolation the consolation of all that is gift. That gift is the donation of self, the gifting of ourselves. And through that gifting, we enter into consolation. But as you are aware from the exercises, Ignatius takes us through a journey, a pilgrimage in which what we first do is clean up our own house. Today in modern psychology, this is the first step of transformation. Jordan Peterson says, if you want to change the world, if you want to make it better, first clean your room. And in a sense, this is the essence of Ignatian spirituality. We begin with ourselves. We clean our rooms, the rooms around us and the room within us. Here's Jordan Peterson speaking of this journey in today's contemporary sense. How, as, as a message to people who are watching this and trying to work their way through, a lot of young people who are trying to navigate this increasingly perilous minefield of d divisive politics in today's day and age, how do they know what are the heuristics they use? What are the signposts they use to, to understand, am I on the right path? Is, is what I'm being taught or is what I'm being attracted to politically motivated from a sense of what's actually best for the community that I'm nominally caring for? Well, that requires, you might say, well, that requires careful meditation and prayer. You know, if you wanted to be traditional about it, I would say you have to orient, you have to determine, this is a, a process of soul searching. What are you oriented towards? And the answer could easily be nothing. Well, this is why I produced the future authoring program. You, like, you gotta be oriented towards something because otherwise you're disoriented. You just spin around in circles and then you suffer. And so do people around you. It's not a good solution. Orient yourself towards something. You have to figure out what it is. What will work for you? What goal? Would, would justify the suffering of your life. Start trying to piece that together. You're going to get better at it, but it's a personal process. And, and you should use your education to inform that. So you need a personal place to stand because otherwise you're going to be handed a place to stand on a plate. And it may be one that, that makes you a puppet of someone else's goals. So I would say, you know, I, 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 what, are the, what are the processes? Well, I think what I've recommended to people is Clean up your room. That's a good start. Organize your local landscape. Schedule your time. Start taking control of yourself. See if you can stop saying things you know to be lies. That's not the same as telling the truth. You don't get to do that to begin with because you're not good enough at it to even attempt it in some sense. But everyone can stop saying things they know to be falsehoods. They can use their own damn definition of falsehood. Right, but in your definition, importantly, I think, in your definition, falsehood includes the higher level moral truth. Falsehood. Yes, it's living wrong. It's, it's, you can say something that is literally true, but of course, like you said earlier, it's a black truth in the sense that at a moral level, you're saying something to cause a social effect yes. that is actually okay. negative. I say, stop saying things that violate your conscience instead of stop saying things you know to be untrue because right. we run into the truth problem. But I would say stop, here's another idea, stop saying and doing things that make you feel weak. 
Just all you have to do is pay attention to that. Some things you do will make you feel disintegrated. It's a physiological sensation. Disintegrated and weak. It's something that Carl Rogers commented on. And he, he thought about that as part of... Uh oh, now I can't remember the word. It's something like integrity. Um, but that isn't the word he used. But some things... Some things improve your integrity and some things disintegrate you. Now, the things that disintegrate you, you often do to impress other people or because you're taking a shortcut or you're escaping what you know to be your moral obligation. And your moral obligation stems naturally from your aims. Like once, once you have aims, you have moral obligations. They come together because the moral obligation is what you need to do in order to obtain the aim. So, and if you don't have an aim, well then you're aimless, so that's not a solution. So along with the aims come the moral obligations. Then when you violate the moral obligations, you'll have a sense of that violation. It's like, well, you have to stop doing that. Or, or that's something you could do. You don't have to. You don't have to do any of this. But I would say that's where, where people should start. You start small. It's not small. You think it's small. It's not small. I had a girl come up to me last night at the end of my talk, and this happens all the time. She said, I started cleaning up my room last year and it completely changed my life. She said, your room is an externalization of your mind. And that's right. That's exactly true. To the degree that you're in your room, the room is you. Now, that isn't how people think, but that's okay. It doesn't matter if they think that way. That's how it is. So, straighten up what you can straighten up and quit saying things that make you feel weak. And then, then you'll know what to do next. So if you want to make your world better, first make the world around you better. And really this is the heart of Ignatian spirituality. Begin with your internal room, extend it to the room around you, and that in turn will build the kingdom. To conclude this section, Howard Gray again summarises the labour of the exercises in the second week is to establish a contemplative context in which the maker and the giver see the mission of Jesus as a continuing enterprise in which the risen Lord invites this woman or this man to join him. Let's spend some time now briefly on the constitutions of the society. The constitutions are as important a document for understanding Ignatian spirituality and formation as the exercises. They are preceded by two preliminary documents, the formula of the Institute, a copy which can be found on the internet, and the general examine. Both are accompanied by declarations which clarify and make clear the points of detail. The formula is a document sent to Pope Paul III in 1539, when Ignatius and his companions had discerned to begin a religious order. It is a clear statement of the society's purpose and spirit it was updated in 1550 following, again, the knowledge gained through the lived experience of living the life. And it is that version that was sanctioned by Julius III. The general exam is comprised of eight chapters and asks the candidate a number of questions to assist them to explore and assess their own suitability for this particular form of religious life and whether there are any impediments to block their entry. In its fourth chapter, it presents the candidate with an insight into the type of life they would be expected to live. This is an important chapter for understanding Ignatian spirituality. I'm going to pause here for an activity, and I'd like you to turn to letter 19, the Louvain letter written in 1547, which is entitled En Route to the Constitutions. It commences on the Indian text on page 195. Read this letter reflectively and write insights and responses on the week six forum. Pause the lecture here while you complete this task. I would expect perhaps 20 to 30 minutes is required. Then proceed to the next slide. The general examine. Ignatius was very selective on who could join the society. 
He was adamant not to open the gates to crowds, especially as the society began to become more well known, more successful and more readily recognised. This attracted more applicants to the Jesuit vocation. Rebeniniera wrote, quote, Although in the beginning he, that St Ignatius, was not over particular in admitting persons into the society, he later became much stricter and said that if there was one reason for which he would like to live longer, it would be to make entrance into the society more difficult. Also, Ignatius did require a complete abnegation of self from his companions and from those who expressed a desire to join them. Ignatius was sure that the road to sanctification was difficult. On Ark, you will find an activity number two, a text called Ignatius' Summary of the Constitutions. Read this text and write a reflective response in the forum. Pause the lecture here to complete this task. Again, I would recommend spending 20 to 30 minutes in prayerful reflection on this text. This text is characteristic of Ignatius and is an insight into what follows contained in the constitutions themselves. It is specific to Jesuits. Now, not all could embrace a life that Ignatius required. Now, this did not mean that they could not live a good and holy life, and many did. While they did not join, end up staying with the Jesuits or joining the Jesuits, they found a home for themselves in the other religious orders in the day. As with all different forms of religious life, it takes a particular grace to live the life of a Jesuit. An example of this could be that of Francisco Sabata. At one stage, he had received a very harsh punishment from Ignatius for being disobedient over a matter involving Isabel Rosa. Now, while he was corrected, no further action for him was taken. But later, Ignatius dismissed him from the house immediately when he discovered that he had made fun of a public act of humility that Nadal had made. Now, following his dismissal, after that, he never did return to the society. It's perhaps important to note what Ignatius felt deserve, deserving of correction and deserving of expulsion. If we are to help and help one another, another, then when someone makes a public act of humility, that person should be supported, helped, assisted, because they're doing what they can to grow closer to God. The Constitutions. Today the Constitutions are divided into ten parts. It's interesting to note the categories of those segments. It begins with the admission of candidates, and is immediately followed by dismissal of the unsuited. Then the manner of providing for, pro for progress in body and soul, followed by training and learning for service, admission in the society, then concerns for those admitted, the manner of choosing mission fields, the duty of maintaining union with each other and with the general, the general and the government of the society, and the manner of preserving the society and its growth. The formula had expressed that the future general, in collaboration with the members of the society, should be the ones who draw up a constitution for the society. Ignatius, in March 1547, asked his secretary, Polanco, to assist him in composing the document. Now, Polanco had had vast experience in the courts of the Holy See. He had, in fact, been secretary to the Holy See. And so he possessed the necessary skills to aid Ignatius well in this task, to produce a document that would be acceptable to the church of his day. 
His method of assistance is interesting to note. Polanco began to submit a series of doubts. From what he submitted, it's clear that he had a very good knowledge of monastic rules. He presented these questions to Ignatius and recorded his responses. Before 1549, he gathered these materials into 12 sections. He had also drawn up the constitutions for the colleges and universities. By 1550, in a number of notebooks, the first complete draft of the constitutions had been compiled. This version was divided into 10 parts, and these divisions have survived right up until the present day. These were then presented, along with the text of the general examine, to a group hand-picked by Ignatius, who then offered their suggestions. When their suggestions were received, further amendments were made. The text was finally promulgated between 1552 and 1555 in different provinces by Nadal and Riviera. But Ignatius continued to revise and perfect the text. Translated into Latin at the end of Ignatius's life by Polanco, it was finally approved on September the 10th, 1558, by the first general congregation of the society in its decrees 78 to 79. It was printed in 1559. Now, due to the close collaboration, a question has arisen in our time, but also in previous centuries, regarding the influence of Polanco on the text. Most commentators and scholars would say there is no doubt that the text is definitely that of Ignatius. However, they concede it would not have taken the shape it did without the assistance of Polanco. Now this question of who wrote the text, who is the author, who had the most influence, dates back to even when Ignatius was alive. We know this because in a report by Nadal, he said that on one occasion Ignatius had stated, for the substance of things there is nothing of Polanco's in the constitutions, unless something concerning the colleges and universities. Even that, though, is according to his own thought. One could question why Ignatius felt it necessary to make such a statement. Perhaps this is something we can ask Jose Garcia later in the year when he visits to deliver the next unit in the Grad Cert of Ignatian Spirituality Award. The constitutions are the inspired text of Ignatius. Their form and order, however, are perhaps attributed to his secretary, Polanco. But I'm willing to be challenged on this position by those who have more knowledge and more authority than I. Ignatius' spirituality in the constitutions. On this slide are the texts that are of particular interest for the student who wishes to deepen their knowledge of Ignatian spirituality. The constitutions are available from the Dalton Mackey Library. The spiritual teachings of Ignatius, time and time again, we return to these phrases, the service of God and God's glory. Interior direction is always as a result of the grace at work within the person. In all of Ignatius's writings, there are repeat, repeated formulas in the text, such as in the Lord, according to the suggestion of the Holy Spirit, according to what you judge in the Lord, the inner law of charity, which the Holy Spirit traces and engraves upon the heart will contribute to this more than any written constitutions. We spoke in previous weeks of the different graces asked for in the exercises and it's very clear that there is a primacy of grace to be alerted to in these texts. Grace is the central gift and outcome and expectation of one entering into a relationship with God. For this next activity, 
pause the lecture here and spend some time on handout three. Please forgive the state of the text. It was photocopied from a rather old book. You begin on page 147 and read through to 148. This is a passage that was written by St Ignatius himself and it reveals the essential nature of Ignatian spirituality. Please pause the lecture here and spend about 30 minutes reflecting and analysing what Ignatius is saying about Ignatian spirituality in this text. Please remember to include your reflections on the week six forum. Welcome back. What is the apostolic end of the society? The apostolic end of the society and the primary role of grace are evident throughout the text of the exercises and the constitutions. All is done for charity. A quote from the constitutions. This little society which was approved in 1540 by His Holiness, not only for the salvation and perfection of our own souls, but energetically to help and perfect the souls of our neighbour. This sums up the end purpose and apostolic mission of the Society of Jesus. In order to achieve this mission, religious poverty remains at its very heart. In the constitutions, it is poverty that is described as the strong bulwark of religious life. There is an urging here that it be preserved at all costs. The primacy of grace is one element of the constitutions, but the centrality of poverty is also evident. It dates back as early as the 1541 version where it was discussed. To the novices Ignatius wrote that all should love poverty as a mother. But poverty is not something to achieve in its own right. It must be accompanied by perfect obedience. Poverty and obedience are bound to the apostolic end of this society. In Ignatian writings the term mission includes every apostolic labour, every work of reform and evangelisation. This ideal of apostolic obedience made by the society so that one is ready to respond to the requests of the Pope and such an obedience requires the presence of superiors. Robinera wrote in his text Ignatius's Manner of Governing, quote, our father taught that authority is of course necessary to help our neighbour and to do him good. Ought therefore it be sought after. That this authority however is not acquired by anything that smacks of the world but through contempt of the world and through true humility and by showing more by deeds than by words that one is a disciple and an imitator of the humble Christ and that one wishes for and seeks only for his glory for God. One should always begin with what is lowly if one wishes to arrive at what is high. What is high is favoured by the Lord who resists the proud and exalts the humble. So having superiors means that Ignatius needed to reflect on what qualities a superior or a leader need have. This list here, gleaned from the writings of Ignatius, should be, at this stage of our studies, no surprise. We see at the top of the list there, union and familiarity with God in prayer and action. A leader must be a model of all virtues, especially charity and humility. Free from disordered affections, they must be serene in judgment, not offensive, learned, severe but kind, steadfast, have a compassion for the poor and marginalised, be magnanimous and have a strength of soul. 
must be persevering, altruistic, intelligent, prudent, discerning, attentive and careful. This list of what a superior is, is not only for those who aren't superiors to hold a superior or a leader to account, but for the leader themselves to know what manner of leadership their leadership style should take. And of course, a leader in the Society of Jesus, a leader who is immersed in Ignatian spirituality, is seeking to be a leader after the person of Christ. Jesus' way of proceeding, his way of accomplishing the kingdom, is contained in the narratives of his public ministry. Jesus lived an ascetical life, a life of spiritual poverty. That is a life wholly dependent upon God. This requires an openness of self before God and existential poverty would accompany this. Selective choices are made. We must be good stewards of material goods. There will be humiliations in following this path. Christ was unrecognised, his message scorned, he was betrayed by friends and family. There will be humiliations too for an Ignatian leader. Christ's mission was to extend the call of God to everyone, not just an elite group or one people. This mission went out into public places, out into secular reality. It is in these busy spaces, in the marketplace, that people seek their identity. Christ's mission transcends time and space. It is a mission and vocation as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. And what shape did Christ's mission take? Christ's mission was to proclaim, to preach, to teach, and to become the proclamation of what is preached. The humanity of Jesus is the vehicle through which we come to know who God is and the ongoing self-disclosure of who we are. Our true identity emerges. It emerges in this ongoing openness to the mystery of who Jesus is and we come to know who we are before God. Scripture has a very significant role in our prayer and contemplation. It is not intended to be read dispassionately. It is meant to become part of who we are, to influence how we think and respond and the way we view the world. Christ's life revealed in scripture becomes instinctual, it becomes a part of who we are, how we act. In short, it becomes our way of proceeding. Gospel contemplation is how we express our humanness with Christ. We become Christ. We become like Christ, we become disciples of Christ by accompanying Jesus in his mission. Through each contemplation we are knowing, loving and following Christ ever more closely. This state takes a careful attentiveness to read the signs of our times but also the signs that are moving within us. The Ignatian discipline that Ignatius draws us to is in its essence the discipline of authenticity. Ignatius encourages us to be ourselves, to be fully ourselves of who we are before God. How we achieve this is by stopping where we find fruit. This is what Ignatius encourages us to do. We are not called to cover everything in our prayer or to be everything in our lives. Ignatius says we stop where we find fruit in all aspects of life. For this may be where we find the pearl of great price. Ignatius encourages us to stay with what attracts us in the exercises. Stop, reflect, let it mature. Reverence what attracts you because you have been attracted by grace. To this moment, this thought, this knowledge. And this reveals to us, these moments, our true vocation. We are beckoned by God 
but how can we recognize it? For Ignatius, we recognize it through the practice of Ignatian gospel contemplation. Our discipleship is a contemplative discipleship. Returning to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. Following Jesus' baptism, we read in this Gospel, The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. What are you looking for? What is your id quod volo? What is your deepest desire? And here the response from the Spirit is, come and see. The Gospel is always dimensional. We are invited to relive the experience of those 2,000 years ago, now for ourselves. We ask ourselves, how does Jesus want to be present in my life now? We're attentive to, where am I attracted? And we note what is the pattern that emerges through these reflections. The one who guides another in this experience must be a servant, not the master of this process. This is important for how we conduct ourselves in all of our ministries. There is no set content to cover, no distance to cover, no end that we need to make sure that we arrive at. We yield to where God leads the person we are accompanying. This may mean staying in week two or staying on a particular day. It is okay to return time and time again to a particular exercise. Ignatius does not encourage us to move through the exercises to achieve an end, but rather to stay alert and attentive to the movement of grace and to pause where grace beckons us. Why? So that we may at all times and everywhere see apostolically. There is a way that we are called to act at all times. For Ignatius, we are to look and seek for ways to help another. This is the way we find God in all things. In this room, I ask myself, how can I help another? In the street, in my family, in the community. This is what Ignatius taught to novices. They are those who are seeking to become Jesuits and are first entering the Jesuit way of life. Ignatius wanted them to see apostolically. All things, all moments, Ignatius taught, are opportunities to help others. And this is Ignatius's most often repeated, repeated phrase, to help others. We do this by paying attention, by being reverent. We allow the reality to have its life before us. Devotion is the resulting grace of seeing how God is working in this, in my reality, in your reality. We pay attention, we look into another reality. We look into the reality of another person, a situation, a culture. This is what the first Jesuit missionaries did. When you look at their biographies, you see that they looked deeply into the situation they arrived in. You see them dress like those who they were ministering to. They learn their language. They study their religion, their music, their literature. They seek to find God already present rather than bringing a mindset of transporting God to them. They first understand who these people are and then they enter deeply into their reality. There is a role for remembering. 
Remember that Ignatius used to go back in his journal and check through and compare week to week, month to month, year to year, even hour to hour, to see his progress in his spiritual development. Remembering or remembrance gives us the opportunity to revisit and uncover wisdom and to cherish that recovery. We then reintegrate this into our experience of the present. We must allow those who we accompany in our ministries to absorb and embrace their own reality. And we must learn it so that we too can become part of their reality. And in that way, we can become true companions. It is only in this way that we will be able to assist them to recognize the movements of grace in their life. Recall that when Jesus touched, it was a healing touch. It is a true act of love to become part of the human experience as Jesus did. It is the human experience that we reverence. That experience by allowing the reality of the other to simply be itself. When praying over a gospel, we are careful to be attentive to it. We ask, what is God saying to us here? We enter fully into the gospel scene. This is the same approach that we need to use to all of life and to all realities. What is God saying to us here? And then we enter into that reality fully so that we may help others, serve God, praise God, reverence God and build the kingdom.